Right, welcome everyone um, to the Run Action Group's event tonight in Glenorchy. And um, I don't have much to say tonight, which will all be relieved, but if anyone hasn't heard of the Northern Tunnel Rail proposal, please uh, come and see us and we'll be more than happy to fill you in and um, perhaps uh, push our membership for, for your way. Um, so tonight we're here to hear about Canberra Light Rail and uh, many thanks to our guest speaker Shane Brattenbury, ACT Minister for Territory and Municipal Services, uh, Greens MLA from uh, Canberra for making the time to talk to us this evening. Canberra and Hobart are quite different, um, but they also have a, have a need for improved public transport. And uh, we're a step ahead with uh, the railway, but um, not quite as well progressed with actually implementation. The, the format for tonight is an introduction, which is just about done. Uh, we've allowed up to 20 minutes for Shane, and uh, then another 15 minutes for questions. The, uh, the complicated bit for me is that we're uh, inviting federal candidates to um, express an opinion, uh, hopefully for, and uh, how they will support progressing this project to turn the talk into reality. And then I understand we have to finish about 7 o'clock because there's a, an important precinct meeting taking place somewhere else in this building. So without further ado, um, please join me in thanking Shane, and uh, Shane, please talk to us. Use the microphone. Is everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Mm. I'm just bear with me. I'm all right. Oh, sorry, Shane. That's no, okay. I'll just. Uh... Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for inviting me along. Uh, as Ben said, I'm uh, a member in the ACT Legislative Assembly, and I happen to hold the balance of power this term uh, by myself for my sins. Uh, we ended up with an, in our election last year where we've got 17 members in the ACT. We ended up with eight Labor members, eight Liberal members, and me as the sole Green elected. So, and that's part of this story tonight. So, uh, light rail has been talked about in Canberra for quite some time, uh, but as a result of the parliamentary agreement that I have with the Labor Party to form government, uh, we have committed to starting to build light rail uh, during this parliamentary term. Uh, and it was a key point of the negotiations in that balance of power situation I found myself in. Uh, I ended up with a choice between, on this issue, uh, the Liberal Party who said we'll do some more studies, or the Labor Party who said uh, it's time we got on with it, there's been enough studies and we're going to start building it. So that's the politics of why we're now in a situation in the ACT where uh, we have a commitment to start building it during this parliamentary term. That's kind of the, the background. But it's been kicking around in Canberra for some time. And I put up this slide not for you to read all of the details, uh, but just to sort of show that history where you can see that the first feasibility study was done in 1994. Uh, and since then there has been studies and more studies. Uh, and I was just saying to Ben on the way, and in some ways the Canberra community at the moment doesn't quite believe we're going to do light rail because they've sort of seen studies before and various promises. And there's, I think, a little bit of, I don't want to say cynicism, but people will perhaps believe it when they start seeing these digging holes in the ground and actually doing things. Uh, but there's been a long history, but what we have seen the last couple of years is real momentum behind this, where uh, there was a feasibility study completed last year in the run-up to the election by the previous Labor government, uh, and they put that out there. And for my, for my party, for the Greens, we were sort of pushing it very heavily, and so during the election campaign it became a, one of the key issues. Uh, so that's the background. What we've basically agreed to do, I don't know how people know Canberra very well. I'll try and sort of keep it general enough, but we've agreed to build stage one, which is from the city to Gangarland. Gangarland's the sort of newest part of Canberra to the north of the city. It's got a rapid, rapidly growing population, about uh, 40,000 people now, with an ultimate projected population of about 80,000. Uh, it's struggled for infrastructure, uh, and we've had to build one $300 million freeway already to get them in, and we're just starting the construction of a second $300 million freeway. And I tell you those two numbers in the context of uh, the projected cost of light rail is $600 million, and for a long time the debate has been we can't afford light rail, and yet it's fascinating that it's been two $300 million freeways haven't had a lot of debate, but one $600 million light rail has had a massive debate to get us to this point. Uh, so this first stage is 12 kilometres. At the same time, we're doing a light rail master plan for the whole of Canberra so that this really does become stage one and once it's 
roll out and then start looking at what is the next part of the city we should build light rail to. The first tracks are planned for 2016, uh, so we've got a parliamentary term that goes up to October 2016. Uh, a couple of major stops along the way. We've got a benefit cost ratio of 2.34, so in plain English that means for every dollar we invest, there's $2.34 of economic benefit. And I'll come back to that uh, a bit later on. And already works now going on on integrating it with our bus network because of course it will have a massive impact on the current public transport network in the ACT as we as we bring it on stream. Uh, so for those who don't know the city so well, it's sort of a map. So this is Lake Burley Griffin down here, uh, the city, and then just going north from there. The Parliament House is down here for those that maybe knows where Parliament House is. Uh, the, cor the corridor as it currently is, Northmont Avenue is the main avenue into Canberra from Sydney. Uh, it's currently very heavily congested, it's six lanes already, so three lanes in each direction. Uh, and the current average speed on Northmont Avenue in peak hour is 20 kilometres an hour. To give you a sense of, you know, what the key drivers for doing this part of Canberra first is the terrible congestion we're having, you know, by Canberra standards anyway, it's not Sydney, let's face it. But, you know, to have an average speed of 20 kilometres an hour it tells you that we've got an unsustainable traffic corridor. Uh, it's also an area where we have a significant potential for redevelopment. And again, I'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, but there's a lot of activity along this corridor and certainly a significant amount of government-owned land that we have the capability to redevelop. Uh, so these are sort of some honest impressions of what it might look like. Uh, what you can see is that this is very much about not only the transport corridor, but then the urban infrastructure that will go around it. And that's a really important part of this whole project. It's about sort of shaping Canberra up to be a modern city. So you'll see we've essentially got um, light rail up the middle here, and then the road corridors on the outside. And you can see a significant level of relatively dense development on either side. Uh, so both making use of the available land, but also providing uh, a, a passenger base to use the light rail. So it's very much about that uh, city integration. And similarly, this is sort of an aerial view of what it'll look like. So again, you'll see that pattern where it's about having a, a city that's got active transport and integrated transport. So we've got uh, pedestrians here on the outside, then the cycle lane, so that uh, we've got that, the roads, the rail lane, similar on the other side. So really creating a, a modern, in some ways European type environment. Uh, I've spent a number of years, as it happens myself, in a previous life uh, working in Amsterdam, which is a city that's very much designed like this with good bicycle integration, uh, pedestrian integration, so that's what we're looking for in Canberra, to have both good public transport and good active transport to create a healthy lifestyle in our city as well. Again, just uh, for people who do well with visuals, a sense of what it's going to look like. Uh, this is Northport Avenue, where we've got the three lanes of traffic. Uh, we had an interesting discussion in Cabinet on Tuesday where the Ministers were talking about whether we should actually take out one of the lanes of traffic to further promote the use of light rail. Uh, but uh, for me, one of the important parts is we have got growing traffic anyway, uh, and we need light rail to both improve car travel time for those that do need to travel by car, but also provide a viable alternative to car. And so there's an interesting debate there about which way we should go. Uh, and that'll sort of come out in the further design works as we go along. Uh, we'll have various stations along the way. Uh, and again, halfway between these two town centres, uh, there's a place called Dixon, for those that know Canberra. And there's already a significant amount of uh, government offices there. And again, we're looking at making that a significant hub along the way because it's a well-known restaurant district. And again, we've just in the last couple of years seen new high-rises going in the area, so there's a strong community there already. One of the key questions we get is, is Canberra suitable for light rail? Uh, perhaps not unlike Hobart, there's been a significant investment in our road infrastructure. Uh, certainly as Canberra grew significantly through the 70s, it was the era when uh, building freeways and building great car infrastructure was a thing. And with the Commonwealth subsidising the city, a lot of money was spent on uh, road infrastructure. And frankly, it's a great city to drive in. Uh, now that's, that can't last forever, as our population is growing, we are seeing congestion in a way that the city has historically not known. Uh, but we do have a relatively small population, a bit bigger than Hobart, but uh, relatively small. But it is expected to increase significantly. 
And one of the other challenges the city is facing is it's a very spread out city. Uh, and the further out we go, of course, the harder the transport gets for people on the fringes. A lot of money spent on petrol driving in and out of the city, and you get that sort of poverty transport effect. Uh, and this, this slide demonstrates that this is Canberra overlaid over Sydney. Uh, so this is the southern edge of Canberra and the northern edge up there, and you can see the sort of shape of it over Sydney. It's a very spread out city, significant driving distances, and that's one of the challenges for us in terms of, of the density of the population. The population of Sydney these days is 4 million or so. Uh, that's 376,000 people in Canberra. Uh, and so one of our key challenges is in providing new public transport is density and that's why a lot of the work that's going around the project is also about urban intensification and actually ensuring that we um, both provide the customer base for the light rail but also stop the city spreading. Every time we build a new suburb, we're also removing endangered woodlands and endangered grasslands. So <coughs> Canberra's got some of the best examples of those uh, remnant vegetation types. Uh, Again, on density, this is a bit of a global table. Don't worry about the figures too much, but what it shows is you know, some of the big cities, Sydney, New York, Los Angeles. I, mean, I find it really interesting that LA is up here on the top of the list of density. Everyone thinks of LA as this big, spread out, car dominated city. That's a bit of an aside, but certainly you've got Canberra and Hobart down here with very similar densities. Uh, and I guess part of the reason for putting that up there is to say when it comes to the discussion about whether light rail is suitable for Hobart. I think you shouldn't be discouraged by the sort of pressures we face in Canberra about not being dense enough. Because we believe it will work in the ACT. Uh, I touched before on um, the cost estimates. Now, we're, in some ways we're fortunate in Canberra. The, the actual corridor for light rail has been reserved. It's part of the original Griffin design for Canberra. Rapid transit comes up as a lot less expensive. Interestingly though, when you do the benefit cost ratios, bus rapid transit comes out higher, but the actual studies show that the benefits of light rail are higher. The, the BCR comes out the way it does because of the cost differential. So the overall benefits for Canberra from light rail are greater, but because the cost is greater you see that difference in the uh, cost benefit ratios. But nonetheless, it still shows that for each dollar we invest we'll get more than two dollars back in economic benefit. And uh, that sort of is important. The other thing I was going to mention here is just well, talking about the, the challenges, I suppose, what we've now started to see is that the opposition party has just in the last month or two decided that it's going to use the light rail as an attack point on the government. And so we're starting to see it. the first time in the ACT this debate emerged just in the last six or eight weeks uh, about um, whether it's a good idea or not. And so the examples we've seen last week were one where it came out and said that uh, the, the first projections are that, in the first instance, the light rail will attract 1,500 more passengers per morning peak hour than the current bus network. Uh, and so the opposition took the $614 million cost, divided by 1,500, and said it's going to cost $433,000 for every person that uses it. Now, terrible maths, because it's a once-up. You know, this is a light rail system, you're going to use it more than once. But that's the kind of level of analysis we're getting at the moment. Uh, then on the weekend they ran another story that said uh, they broke it down for uh, households, rate paying households in Canberra and worked out a cost per household and then sort of said, so for this part of Canberra it's going to cost $70 million and they'll never get to access the light rail. So it's this very populist campaign that's going on that is um, unfortunately I think beginning to undermine the confidence and so as the government We've got a bit of work to do to get back on the front foot. The government's sort of been off quietly preparing light rail, recruiting a project director, getting the governance in place, and so not uh, taking on the PR war too well. But I think this has been an interesting development which I hadn't anticipated, because this is very, the light rail is quite popular in Canberra. And so it's going to be interesting to see uh, how this resonates in the, uh, in the community in the next month or two. More generally, I guess the question of, of why light rail for Canberra? Well, as you will have seen, there is a, a light rail revival going on across the planet. We're seeing developments in Perth, the Gold Coast, uh, various cities around the world. Uh, and I think there's a recognition, and this goes back to sort of, again, the Hobart connection, where unfortunately, like, you know, your rail system was taken out in the 70s, but there's a sense of 
you know, winding the clock back and saying, well, actually, this is a really effective way of moving people around. Uh, and it has, a, I guess, an X factor, and it's the only word I can think of. There's no other way to describe it, but rail seems to have that X factor that buses don't have. And this goes back to my earlier observation about the, the different benefit-cost ratios, but what we've observed in Canberra is that people just won't take the bus. And this is a globally observed phenomenon, whereas rail seems to have that a romance or an attraction that really brings customers in a way that, uh, that buses don't. And so for me, that's why uh, myself and my party, we, we chose rail as the perhaps the preferable alternative to, to the bus rapid transit. Uh, look, there's a range of other reasons. We need to reduce our car dependence uh, from a, both a, an environmental point of view, but also a, a congestion point of view. If we take Northcote Avenue, which is the one we're going to replace light rail on, it's already six lanes wide. We can't make it any wider. We'd have to literally bulldoze large apartment blocks to do so. Uh, the demand for it is increasing. We have to do something as a government to provide a transport alternative. Uh, I've talked about the urban renewal opportunities. It's a great opportunity to redevelop the city and make Canberra a, a smarter place. And there's this notion of you know, building a knowledge economy around uh, the kind of people that will move into areas that are modern and redeveloped, also bring a whole new set of skills. And, in Canberra, one of the great challenges we've got is to try and have an industry other than the Commonwealth Public Service. Uh, and again, I know for Hobart, this is a, you know, or for Tasmania generally, there are economic issues that are not dissimilar to some of the challenges Canberra faces, where you've perhaps been very dependent on one or two large things. Uh, and this sort of economic diversification is something we see coming uh, with this kind of urban renewal that light rail will drive. Uh, light rail in particular, I've talked about the differences between buses and um, and light rail, the best overall outcome, uh, but it's also the, the speed, the reliability, uh, and it does move more people more quickly. And this graph, oh, is like an image and it demonstrates it perfectly. That's how many cars it would take to carry those people, three buses or one light rail. And so just in terms of space, and space is valuable in a modern city, space is money, space is opportunity cost. And so uh, the space factor is just one that's significant and as well. The other beauty of light rail, of course, is that it's electric. And so as we move into a world in which we are further and further challenged to uh, move away from fossil fuels and do things in a renewable way, uh, we, of course, can power it through renewable sources. I've talked a bit about the urban renewal. Uh, this is currently the urban, this is the urban form that we have along the edge of North Miami. So the main gateway to Canberra, some of the most valuable land in the city. Oxy. And um, these are the apartments we have. I'm actually also the Minister for Housing in the ACT. These are government housing flats, so I feel as the owner of them, I can't afford to be a little derogatory, so don't mind me being rude about them. But yeah, this is, they're terrible. They've got, no, they've got a zero star energy rating. No one wants to live in them. And yet they're on the best real estate in the city. We have an opportunity to, to bulldoze these, essentially. They're not particularly attractive. Uh, and we've already started to design alternative things where we can you know, build urban villages, we can fit a lot more people in, we can build better quality, better comfort houses, and uh, people will, will increase our urban density and produce a better quality of life and better environmental performance overall. Uh, so all of this is leading to, I guess, the vision we have of the future of Canberra and light rail being a critical component of that. Uh, we've got transport targets, 30% of our journeys to work to be by sustainable modes by 2026. Now that's walking, cycling and public transport. Uh, but again, if we can have that light rail as a spine, we'll create an environment which people might cycle down to the light rail station or walk down to the light rail station and then jump on rather than taking their car. Uh, and so this is an important part of that. Uh, we do see an expanding network across the city. One of the biggest complaints I've had about light rail in, in terms of that criticism from the opposition. Uh, actually, the biggest complaint I've had from people is why they're not getting it in their part of Canberra. Uh, my sister happens to live in the southern part of town. Every time I go around for a family dinner, she complains to me about why they didn't push it to their part of town first. Uh, but I'm getting regular tweets at the moment from people saying, what about this part of town? What about that part? So I'm encouraged by the fact that the community is so very supportive of light rail. Um, as I've talked about, the, the higher density and less spreading out of the city is an important part of this. Uh, the agglomeration benefits. I believe in having a better public transport system will be more resilient as oil prices increase and obviously reduce our climate footprint. 
Uh, and I've talked also about the, the desire to have a healthier and more active city, which again, I think having this sort of improved public transport, uh, the, the cycling infrastructure that will go with it, is all part of the deal. So look, that's a very general overview of where Canberra's at. I think the most important message is that you know, we finally decided to do it, bit the bullet. Uh, and what's been very fascinating in doing that, in making the political commitment to do it, it's actually drawn out all of these companies that are now coming and seeing myself as one of the ministers, but also the treasurer, the chief minister, and saying, look, uh, we're really excited that you're doing this. We've got, you know, here's our idea of how you could do it. We've had one land developer come along who's basically said, if you give me this big parcel of land along the route, which, you know, admittedly is $800 million worth of land, but if he can have that, he'll take it, he'll develop it, but he'll also build us the light rail system at the same time as part of his cost structure. Now, whether that's the right deal for Canberra or not, the point is there's this incredible innovation going on around the fact that we've done it. One of our challenges with Northbourne Avenue is that all of the infrastructure, the, the gas lines and the telephone lines are all down the middle of, of Northbourne Avenue. And one of the big costs is going to be we have to dig those up and move them. But again, we've got companies coming forward now saying, actually, no, you don't need to do that anymore. You can put this steel casing over the top so you can still access them if you need to and just sit light rail on the top of that. So the political commitment to build it is driving or is bringing forth a whole lot of new ideas and innovation, which is really exciting as well. And people saying, Actually, it won't cost that much. There's this new technology. You can do this to that. So it's an exciting phase. But uh, yes, I guess the moral of that story is one needs the political commitment to make it happen. Uh, but we certainly are very enthused in the ACT about the benefits we believe it will bring to the city. Let me stop there, because otherwise I'll just keep enthusing on all night. But I'm happy to, as long as Ben wants to, take questions or um, talk about the Hobart situation, maybe you like a bit. So. Before we do that, I should acknowledge a few celebrities in the room, I guess. <laughs> so I've got uh, from Milwaukee City Council, Alderman Christy Johnston. Uh, any of your fellow Alderman here? Um, also got Adriana Taylor, MLC, who joined me on the bus this morning. Thanks for coming, Adriana, long time supporter. Uh, Scott Bacon, Minister for Tourism and Finance, and uh, Labor Minister, I mean, State Labor Member for Denison. Thanks for coming, Scott. Lisa Archer, State Liberal Member for Denison. Again, a long time supporter. Uh, Can you use the microphone, mate? Then wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. Okay. okay. I think it's on. Switch it on, instead. Just don't talk as loud as shame. <laughs> and uh, also, Heather Hazelgrove, uh, CEO of Metro Tasmania. Heather, thanks for coming along. I'm sure you're looking forward to Monday meeting trains and buses. Um, and uh, so, Shane, thanks very much. And just before we go into questions, wouldn't it be great? Oh, the, the, federal, the federal candidates will have a, a presentation at the end, so we'll introduce them and... Uh, no offence, Andrew. Um, <laughs> I wasn't offended, it was just very curious of my colleagues to... Well, we'll do the federal uh, member and candidates now, I think. Uh, uh, Andrew Wilkie, independent uh, federal member for Denison. We've also got uh, Anna Reynolds, Greens, uh, candidate for Denison. Deb Thurley, uh, part of the United Party, candidate for Denison, and uh, Penelope and Senate candidate, uh, Green Senate candidate. Are there any other federal candidates who would like to say a few words at the end? We just need to apportion the time accordingly. So it's just uh, just four, and I've also got a, a statement that ja uh, Jane Austen from the Labor Party is asking me. But um, all right, well, well that's enough for me. Um, are there any questions for Shane? It seems surprising that it's not. It seems surprising there's not more reference to the popularity and effectiveness of the Melbourne tram system when uh, light rail is being promoted. They're obviously linked. I agree with you. Yes, I mean, you you think about all the great cities around the world, they have this kind of infrastructure, you know, and it's it's popular and it's heavily used where it's built in, and and the cities of formed around it in some ways and so that's that it, it becomes this positive feedback loop of sort of reinforcing why it's useful and, and why it gets further invested in. You know Sydney's now about to do light rail down George Street. Uh, the, the logistics of that are nightmarish but the fact that they're prepared to go through such pain on such a major thoroughfare in Sydney to retrofit this infrastructure tells you how effective the New South Wales government of various persuasions because you know, it's been going for a while, I've decided this kind of infrastructure is. 
Yep. Hobart's incredibly lucky. You guys have got the corridor. You've got the rail lines. You just got to whack the trains on top. Thanks. I've got a loud enough voice to, to handle it. Uh, just a, a few comments, please, Shane. Um, I'm interested to notice that this is the first time I've seen overhead wiring on any of the uh, pictures of the camera. Like, well, have you looked at other? I've got three questions. I'm sure. Just them through. Have you looked at any other forms of, of power approach, for example, inductive? Uh, secondly, uh, your costs seem somewhat high. You're talking about $47 million a kilometre. Now, um, UK is $20 million on average, uh, Europe 32, US 26.5. Now, I do realise that there's apparently about $200 million to, to shift things around in Northbourne Avenue, but even so, it seems somewhat high. Also, your rolling stock figure of $11 million a unit seems uh, extremely high. Uh, on a worldwide basis, it's normally three to, to five million. I believe Gold Coast is get, getting a, a Bombardier seven unit job for about five million, and Perth uh, got one for, <coughs> got their units to 4.5 million, and which seems quite a lot less than your 11. Uh, also, please, I would like a copy of how you co calculated your cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. It seems rather high. Sure. Uh, let me take those in order and I'll jot them down sure. so I don't forget any. Um, in <laughs> terms of overhead wires, that, has, that is certainly the, the way it's been dreamed up. But there, again, as, as I was touching on before, now that we've decided people are coming forward and we've <laughs> certainly been given ideas to us that inductive power and obviously, being Northmont Avenue in particular, yeah. there's going to be a visual amenity issue in the National Capital Authority, which is the federal bit of the government that oversees Canberra as the national capital, will be heavily involved in this. They'll have to approve it, and they may insist. Uh, the suggestion is that it's more expensive than overhead wires, but it may be a cost that we have to bear. Which brings me into the question of the costs. I agree with you, the costs seem exceptionally high. Uh, these $614 million costs comes from the costings that were done by the government last term. Uh, the previous one before that had been an $800 million yes. estimate. They've brought it down to 614 I still think that's overpriced. Uh, and I'm optimistic that as we go to market, and as more work is done, uh, we can deliver it for less than this. And you know, we've talked to groups that will like the Gold Coast, uh, the Australian Railways Association, who are citing the kind of figures that you're citing. Uh, so, yes, I'm hopeful. I remain optimistic we can deliver it for less than the current price tag. Uh, and the same thing applies to the rolling stock figure. I, you know, I do have a sense, and Ben and I were talking about this in the car on the way out, that um, there may be some in the bureaucracy who have not been big fans of this. And they may well have provided us with some gold-plated costings in an endeavour to try and perhaps undermine the case. Gold-plated units. Well, indeed, indeed. I, I'm looking forward to my individually warm right? seat on the light rail at that price. Um, and the cost-benefit ratio, we are just about to release some of the work in the next week or two. Uh, it's a lot of it went into Infrastructure Australia. We've got to go through a process of getting clearance from them and various other bits and pieces. But and partly, it's there's been an issue, and where the space has come, I think, for the opposition to attack it is some of this information hasn't been available. And then again, there's been a reticence on some parts of the government to release it, but I think it's really important that all of the information is available in the public domain so that the public is able to have full confidence in it and also to be able to see the detail and so that we do have that critical debate. So that it's just I'm interested because I reckon it's been understated in Hobart. Right, OK. Yeah. But it should be available on the Hobart. ACT government's website, if not this week, next week. Thank Keep you. an eye on it, yes. It's, it's scheduled for a sort of release. It just went through Cabinet the other day to clear it to be released, so it's kind of any day now. The other, one of the other ministers is responsible for releasing it. That's just why I don't know the exact timetable. But. Um, Shane, you. delightful to hear you, but I want to weep because I'd love to have the same enthusiasm from our Greens ministers as you have, obviously, in your own, uh, given to your own parliament. Um, the cost-benefit ratio is also something that I'm interested in because we keep being told that 40,000 people, which is about what our track, I guess, would go through, 
um, is too few. We're too small a city. We keep being told we're too small to be able to afford light rail. And I love the fact that at the beginning you said this is going, this is corridor is servicing about 40,000 people. Hopefully, of course, they're going to uh, that number is going to grow with high density housing. But we would have the same um, potential, I suppose. But our cost ratio benefit came out at originally less than one, and that's why. You know, we were told, well, this is not a viable business proposition. I'd like to know who the company is that did yours. <laughs> sure. And how come they ended up with 2.34 and we ended up with less than one, for it seems to me much the same kind of population. Sure. Well, again, when it becomes available in the next little while, you'll be able to see it. Uh, I don't, can't remember the name of the company that did it because I wasn't in the ministry last term, so I don't know. But uh, I find that surprising given the cost of the Hobart system, which, you know, I've heard the figures of 70 to $100 million. What I would say around uh, the issue of whether there's enough people is that, and this is perhaps a, a philosophical view on my part, so I'll, I'll put that right on it, but you know, if you build it, they'll come. The development will happen around it, and I think, and this is the philosophical bit, that's where government has a role to play. Yes. And government is supposed to make these investments because there's market failure there otherwise. And when government does these things, it then creates all this other opportunity. And so... We're told that Tasmanians are different, that we won't come. Builders, and we won't come because we like our cars too much. But as you say, that's been shown not to be true everywhere else. Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, one goes for it and that creates opportunity. And that's, I think that would have come through in my presentation as well. Yes, and it's yes. Certainly what we see is a tremendous part of what we're doing in Canberra. It's about the urban form as much as it's about transport. Can, can you explain your comment, Justin, which you just made? If you build it, they'll come. What, what do you actually mean by that? Uh, I, in the sense that, I mean, we've already got a, a customer base there to some extent. A customer for what? The light rail. Right. right. And then the, the bit about that. How, how, have you, how have you established that customer base? Oh, in the sense that there is a population already there that has to move from A to B. We already have 3,000 people a day using public transport down that corridor. Okay, so that, that's, that's competition? Well, no, because we'll take the buses off that route. Sorry? Currently, that's serviced by buses. Yes. We'll take those buses off that route. So, so it's, it's not a, a free market situation that you're proposing? You're going to no, take the buses No, we own buses, buses too. I own buses. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I didn't mean to be flippant. No, but what we, I guess what we're looking at is... No, no, I'm, I'm asking quite yeah, a genuine question. Yeah, no. You've just, to me, you've said you're going to take the buses off. What we'll do is we'll reorient the public transport system. So light rail will become the central spine. Uh, and it will become the, I guess, the high frequency, high speed corridor. And then we'll reorient the buses so that they'll come into that spine. So rather than the buses running down, they'll come in this way. That, that's not what they do in Singapore, for instance. They run them parallel to the light rail. Yeah, I, I guess I don't see the value in, there'll obviously be some crossover, but I don't see the value in running buses parallel to the light rail. So we'll essentially replace some of the buses at the moment with the light rail. So, so you're taking the right choice? There's no Customer choice. choice. <laughs> There's no choice now. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you, you can say that. You're, you're replacing one fourth choice with another. Well, I would argue that under the new scenario, people have a choice between a high-speed light rail system, they'll have an improved cycle infrastructure, and they'll still be able to drive their car down the road should they so wish. I'm, so I'm not sure quite where you're coming at, to be honest. Well, you, I'm just getting at the fact that you're, you, you're going to impose any other cost structures, again, visibly Singapore, where registration, for instance, is... Uh, Okay, we, we need to move on. We've only got a few more minutes for questions. There's at least two more people with their hands up. The system going for over 75 years, and it is because in the city, in the earlier times, in the 20s, also, there were no, not many cars anyway. But now, today, most um, transport in the city is not by car, it's by the electric train. Now, here in, in, in Tasmania, we have a smaller population, but the uh, idea is absolutely brilliant, and we need, uh, of course, we need the uh, bus service to the train to make it efficient, and uh, we need to uh, go ahead with it. 
Mr. Ries, here our Premier, he built the hydro in 15 years, right? Yeah. Now, you, you've been talking since 1994, you said about the Kanbara railway station. That is 18 years ago. Now, you, what's going on? <laughs> you know, here, here, this is, this is impossible, this situation. You've got to get going. Look, I agree with you, and I think that's what I was observing before. I think there's a level of, I don't want to say cynicism, but some level of community scepticism about whether it's going to happen. I, I guess we're now in a place where we've said we are going to build it, as opposed to all those ones, the studies in the past. The interesting part is this area, Gangala, in the north that I was talking about, when that land was first opened up in the 1990s, again, at that time, one of the property developers said, if you give me this parcel of land, I will build the light rail. If they'd done that then, it's quite possible we would not have had to spend some of the vast amounts of money we've had to spend on road upgrades because light rail would have been there from the start and you would have seen a very different development. People perhaps wouldn't have owned two cars who live in that part of town. They might have only had one in their household because they could one car and good public transport. And that's certainly one of my aspirations in this as well. It's a, it actually becomes a cost saving for households where if they only need one car, I've seen figures from the NRMA, to own a second car is the equivalent of about eleven dollars or $12,000 a year for a household. Now, if we can provide a situation where people don't need a second car, that's real cost of living reduction. You know, not a little bit of marginal stuff around the odd tax cut here and there. It's just genuine cost of living changes. Just a quick question. Why, I don't really fully understand why you have to spend all this money on all these feasibility studies. Why can't there be one done by an independent person without any prompting from any different parties for any political purpose and get one answer, which is straightforward and honest, and stop wasting so much money and time. I agree with you. Um, I think that chain of studies that I showed for Canberra, in some ways, when it goes to the politics of it, over the years, governments perhaps not wanted to commit, but they wanted to be seen to be doing something about it, so they kept commissioning studies. And so I agree with you, it's been a waste of money. We should have just done it. But, uh, yeah. time, someone could in one study, an independent party, so that there's no political interference from one side or another, and be honest, get it done, and stop and how much money's been spent on all this, and you still haven't got it going. Well, I mean, I guess the difference now is we are in a phase where the money we're spending now is design money. It's not study, it's about, okay, now we've got to do it, and there is a level of planning that has to go into that, so that's the money we're currently spending. That was just allocated in the last budget. So we're moving past that frustrating stage, I hope. We better be. Okay, so we've got five candidates in almost 20 minutes. So that means almost, uh, we'll, we'll say three minutes each. <laughs> um, and uh, as is politically incorrect, we'll go ladies first now. Jane Austen's an apology tonight, but she's asked me to read a, a brief media release she put out today. Oh, by the way, uh, myself and the, uh, the federal candidates are here, sitting on the front row, joined me on a bus this morning from Bridgewater Hobart, and these people now know full well uh, the, the plight of public transport users in, in Hobart, and just how easily it could be improved with buses and trains. Um, so they may mention that in their talk today. But uh, first up, um, Jane Austen, Federal Labor candidate for Denison today, called on the Federal Labor Government to support Northern Suburbs Light Rail System. Ms Austen has continuously lobbied Deputy Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to support this important project for Hobart and raised it directly with the Prime Minister in system today. We need an integrated approach to public transport in the cities of Hobart and Wanorki and Light Rail should be considered as part of this. I have, Ms Austen said, I have made strong representation to the Deputy Prime Minister to support the light rail project and I have been buoyed by our discussions, said Ms Austen. I would like to see a proposal that has light rail extending to the world-renowned Mona, the suburb of Claremont and the growth areas of Branton and Austin's Ferry and further to Brighton, Ms Austen said. The light rail proposal requires a full cost-benefit analysis and a proper passenger demand analysis and this is exactly what I've asked the Federal Labor Government to support. There has been a lot of work done to date, but we need to do what we need to do now is ensure we have a comprehensive proposal for funding, said Ms. Austin. What is exciting is that there is significant goodwill from all of the groups and individuals involved in the project. The Northern Suburbs Light Rail project has the support of the Hobart Lord Mayor Damon Thomas and the Glenorchy Mayor Stuart Slade, 
and an advocacy of uh, myself, uh, Ben Johnson, and the Northern Suburbs Right Action Group has been tremendous. At the 2013 State Labor Conference, Ms Austin spoke to the party's transport and infrastructure policy platform and successfully amended official Labor policy to include support for light rail. That might be Jane trying to get in now. <laughs> I will continue to advocate for federal Labor government to support this project and bring it to a reality. And uh, that's from Jane. Hopefully I didn't exceed her three minutes. Um, any, any volunteers who'd like to go next? Okay, we'll go from right to my right to left. So, uh, Deb Thurley is the uh, United Parliament Party candidate for Denison. So, Deb, you've got about three minutes. I'm only speaking first and, and went first because I was last this morning and didn't get a, an airing, so I've taken the microphone first. But I think there's a, some really important factors to. to consider here. And the fact is that we do have this multi-million dollar corridor existing already. And it really is a case of convincing the bureaucrats, the infrastructure bureaucrats, the sustainable transport bureaucrats, prompted by a minister, some minister, it's not obviously Mr McKim, but some minister needs to prompt it and get it going. Because as you said, procrastination is a waste of money. A waste of time, a waste of money. And the important thing about this link is that it would link the museum precinct in the CBD with the Mona precinct. And that's a really important consideration. But there's also the Botanical Gardens, there's Cadbury's, there's Tattersall's Park, and of course the Mona. But it needs to go to Brighton. And that will enable the suburb of Brighton and Bridgewater to have um, great access to the CBD. Now I would I see Heather in the room and the trip today, Heather, was good. I enjoyed the trip on the bus. It was... <laughs> I did, I paid eight dollars. So uh, from our point of view, if it was the Palmer United Party in control of this, it would get done because that's the difference. And that, that is a party of action. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, look, I think uh, my support for the restoration of passenger rail in Hobart and Glenorchy and beyond is well known. Um, I think the case is compelling. Um, by restoring passenger rail, we will link communities, we will get vehicles uh, off the road, and that will uh, have all sorts of financial uh, and social and safety benefits. It'll help to clean up the environment, it'll be faster, uh, it'll be cheaper. Uh, it's the sort of state building infrastructure that Tasmania needs if it's to be ready for the future and to grow uh, into the future. I support a full train set that goes from Sullivan's Cove in Hobart all the way to Brighton. I do not support the state government's current interest um, in a fraction of a train set which is basically from Hobart to Glenorchy. Now I note the Minister says that that is that is the, so, uh, the scope that will have the passenger numbers to make it pay. Well, I say do your business case again and put a value on all of the social and environmental benefits that will come with passenger rail all the way from Sullivan's Cove right through uh, to Brighton. Um, what this needs is not more bureaucrats and more studies, it needs political leadership and political leaders with a bit of vision and people who will seize the moment. You know, we have a Green as the Sustainable Transport Minister in the balance of power. He could have made it happen. We have a state Labor Green government and a federal Labor government, and until recently I probably could have characterised it as a federal Labor Green government. The conditions were perfect, made even more perfect by the fact that the member for Denison was in the balance of power. If the state government had got its act together, put together a really compelling business case for me to take to Canberra, I reckon we could have got the money. But I can't go to Canberra and ask for $100 million if it's not the state government's plan and if the state government hasn't got its proposal together. So we've had a missed opportunity in this state and federal parliament. Um, but there'll be more opportunities. We've got to be ready for those opportunities and we've got to seize them. And we'll only do that with strong political leadership Ministers and Premiers uh, and, uh, who will look to their bureaucrats and say, stop talking, just do it.
Hi everyone, my name is Anna Reynolds. I'm the Greens candidate for the federal seat of Denison. Uh, one of the first things that I did when I became pre-selected, and I was pre-selected a bit under a year ago, uh, one of the first people I met with was Ben Johnson. And I did that because I've worked on uh, the issue of climate change for about a decade and I'm very committed to the phase out of fossil fuels, to reducing car dependency and all of the benefits that Shane outlined that the Greens are very supportive of public transport. So the light rail project has been one of the key issues that I've worked on. And I think what I want to use my three minutes for tonight is just to tell you what I've done. Uh, I'm just a candidate, I'm not a, I'm not a decision maker yet, I'm not your local member yet. But I have used my time as a candidate to positively put this on the agenda and I think I've done a pretty good job at that. One of the first things I did after I met with Ben was that I um, wrote a submission with Bob Brown to the Legislative Council inquiry. I actually wrote two submissions and raised the issue about how Hobart is not too small a city to have a, a rail project. Uh, this year, in, in uh, February, I organised a round table with key decision makers and movers and shakers at Mona and brought David Walsh into this debate and got it on the front page of the paper because David Walsh said we need a light rail. That is something that I organised. I then organised a follow-up round table at the Hobart City Council uh, to also bring again together those opinion shapers. So the momentum has been building this year and I've also been putting a lot of um, uh, pressure on Nick McKim as Sustainable Transport Minister. I introduced him uh, to an Infrastructure Australia person uh, who came down to Hobart and uh, this, uh, this step of having this task force, this multi-ministerial task force is an important one and I urge you to actually seize on that and keep, uh, keep the pressure on. The time is right. I'm quite encouraged by the Labor Party's new found enthusiasm for this because I think that's important. What we see in ACT is all the parties and all the players really getting behind it and I think we're getting close to that in Hobart now so let's keep going. Uh, you have no, you'll have no doubt that I'm very much behind this project. I think I've used my role in this campaign uh, positively to push this and if I become the member I will keep that enthusiasm and that positive approach to this project to get it going because complaining will not make it happen, but bringing people together, bringing people who want to make it happen together and all pushing together is what makes projects happen. Thank you. I'm Penelope Ann and I'm standing for the Senate for the Greens. Um, a lot of what I would say has already been said. I'm totally in favour and I've been following this for quite a few years now. I think there have been a couple of things overlooked and one of those is it really is important to take the light rail right through to Brighton and one of the reasons is for social justice. The people at Bridgewater desperately need to have alternate um, transport. They can't all afford two cars or even one. And social transport is very important. The other thing that's been overlooked is that we have an ageing population and buses do cater for wheelchairs and for those with problems, but nowhere near as easily as trains do. Recently, the Brooker was awarded or the state government applied for millions of dollars, I think somewhere around 200 to upgrade the Brooker Highway. And it's nice, it's a little bit smoother, but it hasn't changed the opportunities for transport in our city at all and it hasn't added anything new. For 100 million we could now be sitting on light rail and I think if the Labor government had had the will to do it they would have had no problem being re-elected if we were able to go out tonight and hop onto a light rail modern air-conditioned zero emissions train and swish home on it. I think it was a terrible opportunity that was missed and as a Greens candidate well, the Greens are in favour of public transport trains throughout Australia looking to the future. And Tasmania, I think, Hobart particularly, is really um, unique because we can't continue widening our roads forever. We've got the river on one side, mountains on the other, and heritage in the middle. And we don't want a heritage place that is just full of car parks. So I think it's a no-brainer that we go ahead with it, and of course I'll certainly support that. Thanks to Ben for all the work he's done all this time. Uh, thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it.
appreciate um, your opinions, uh, member and candidates. One thank you that I have forgotten is Bernalke City Council. They very kindly provided the venue to us free of charge tonight, and uh, it's great to see them on the project. And uh, just finally, we, we do have an incorporated rail action group, so if you'd like to get involved and give us a hand, it'd be very much appreciated. Um, also, if your car is, hasn't yet got a bumper sticker on them, but uh, we've got them up the back. And also, fridges, there's a magnet there as well at the time. But also, just keep applying pressure when a candidate knocks on your door, make sure you ask them how, not uh, just if uh, they support the project. And um, anything else, Christy? I normally forget something or someone. But... Right, well, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the naughty... May I please Isn't... make one comment right on this? Yep. Very cynical one, I'm afraid. <laughs> Four years ago, Ben and Christy Johnson produced a very valid plan for a battery-powered light rail system which was supported by all the parties in this state. Four years later, we've had 604 pages of documents which actually finally have come out with a proposal that is far worse than their original proposal. At this rate, unless we really get something going, in 20 years' time, we will be looking at something like a Mexican-style horse-drawn track. <laughs> well, thank you for that. We will have a train one day, I'm sure, but I don't quite know how old I will be. <laughs> right, no, thanks very much.